we all know that the biggest threat to our oceans are human beings, are us. So the solution is on us. And we must act now. We don't have time. We are running out of time. And we must act now. I want to start with you, um, Daniela. Activism is key when we talk about changes, when we talk about what can we do to, to start a change from us. It's where it starts, with us. It's not, not, it's not just the knowledge. It's not just I want to do it. When I go back to my house, when I go back to my daily life, I need to start a change. So how, what can you recommend us to start that change from within us? Absolutely. Well, maybe the first place to start is asking yourself, what exactly is it that thing that makes you angry? And, and I'm talking about anger because a lot of people talk about passion. And I don't think that our generation has a privilege to be passionate. I think we have the understanding of what frustrates us and what is breaking our heart and what world we've inherited that we now have to figure out what is it that we're angry about and what is it that we want to change. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's why I started Sustainable Ocean Alliance because I felt so much disappointment and disillusionment being the only young person at this meeting at the UN when I was 19 and looking on stage and seeing world leaders speak about the problems, speak about how bad things are getting and literally no one offer a solution. No one, mm -hmm. not one president, not one CEO of a corporation. Everyone talked about how bad things were, how we're gonna have more plastic than fish by weight in the ocean by 2050, how we are nearing you know, the end of, our, of, the, of the carbon cycle, how we're going to completely destroy coral reefs. And yet these are all facts that we all know about, but no one talked about how are we actually going to create a blueprint, a plan of action, and so that drove me, to your point, to go back to my dorm room. And I, this was literally like on the way back from the UN to my university. I drew two circles. The first circle was our generation, so us. The second circle was world leaders. And the middle circle was Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Because I wanted to build a platform to unite these two worlds. And the outcome of that was solutions. Um, and now we're working with grassroots youth leaders like Dewey, which you'll hear his story. We're working with entrepreneurs that are building these for-profit uh, startup solutions. And then the question becomes, like, how can we take all of that passion and turn it into real business models that can impact the world we live in? Mm -hmm. um, and there's so much opportunity to go off of. Action, yes, action. Dewey, you have witnessed uh, in your own community the impact of climate change uh, and as Daniela said, we hear presidents and leaders talking about what are we supposed to do and evaluating the situation that we all know what's going on. We all know we have the numbers. Now we need to know the how. But do you think like the international agreements are being sufficient and are the way they impact our communities, indigenous communities, black communities? Are they sufficient to make the change, those agreements? I think the recent agreements that have been um, developed by different nations actually try to tackle the problem. But when we come to the implementation of these agreements, there is a lot of misunderstanding and misconceptions on how we can bridge the gap between communities, between science, art, technology, and ancestral wisdom of indigenous people that actually have the knowledge to not only fight climate change, but also try to solve problems such as the biodiversity loss. Mm -hmm. And what we're missing is to have the proper um, understanding on how we can implement into our own communities new technologies that are much needed. And there are different um, indigenous groups and, and people around the world that are trying to bridge this gap, mm -hmm. to bridge this gap between ancestral knowledge and science. And that's what I think that has to be our focus in the next couple of years. How to bring technologies and how to improve the models that have been developed by governments in decades 
and we are the ones that have the power and, and the right to change those models. Yeah, absolutely right, correct. Um, Daniela, you have built a humongous network of young leaders, and they help each other, and they prepare each other, and you mentor them to, to make that change. How important is this um, partnership, right, in fighting against climate change? I think it, the model that we built is very unique because we go to young people globally and as a nonprofit, we don't, we don't tell them what to do. And that's the broken, in my pers from my perspective, the broken world perspective, right? Instead of ask, telling them what to do, we ask them, what problems do you see that are happening in your backyard? What are your ideas? What are your skill sets? And how can we, as Sustainable Ocean Alliance, support you with financing, with mentorship, with research, with education, to enable you to bring your idea to life? And I think it's that partnership, to your point, that we believe in the power and in the ingenuity that young people have globally. And it's our time to take back you know, what once belonged you know, to, to our ancestors and to consider how can we change the business models that have been damaging our planet. And so to me, although it's a very terrifying time, it's also a time for all of us full of opportunity. Pick an industry, any industry, fashion, food production, uh, architectural design, anything, and you can build a company that will be a benefit to the environment. And that's what we need. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we think about the future, the people that are going to win are the people that are building new infrastructure, that are working for corporations or startups that are actually uh, supporting the growth and development and the regeneration of our planet, as opposed to corporations or business models that are harming our planet mm -hmm. actively. That, that takes us to our, to our next point, and is um, nature-based sustainable solutions. Can we talk about that with the DB? It's interesting to hear about nature-based or circular economy because those are the values that my grandmother, my great-grandmother, have taught me since I was a kid. When I was a baby, um, in our culture, we get bathed with different herbs and, and barks and flowers to strengthen our spirit. And then we are also um, being sung. We sung the, the elders of our community sang for us. Mm -hmm. And they, they tell us about nature-based solutions. Mm -hmm. Now we call them nature-based mm -hmm. solutions, but that's the way of living that us indigenous people have had for centuries. And it's sad to know that in some areas of the world, we are still being seen as uncivilized. Mm -hmm. There are many places where we are not being seen as leaders, as we should be seen. And in the moment we change that mentality and we recognize the power of our ancestor, I think is a moment where we're going to make a big change in the whole model. Mm -hmm. Getting involved, you've been very, in, been very involved in politics as well, trying to make that change because if they are not doing it, we have to do it, you have to do it. So uh, for some young leaders, it could be a little scary to start in politics or to, to, to have an idea on how to make the change, how to hold the government accountable. Can you tell us about your experience? Yes, the first time I got to learn about climate change was in 2014 when I was attending One New World in Dublin. At that point, I was invited because I was working on giving access to clear water, drinking water for communities and teaching entrepreneurship to students at the universities. However, in the first session, I had Mary Robinson, Mary Robinson in front of me talking about climate justice, and then I realized that I didn't know much about climate change. I looked in Google, climate change Panama, and I realized in that moment, because of media of other countries, that my people were the first documented case of future climate change refugees. Huh. The islands where I come from, 365 beautiful <laughs> islands, some of them have disappeared already, and some lives have been lost because of the rising tides. And I went back to Panama after attending One Young World with a lot of ideas, and I wanted to use art to make awareness of climate change and to teach what climate change was. 
However, not many people in 2014, specifically in Panama, were aware of about this, and it wasn't one of the main topics in the table. And it was when the president of Panama stopped a law that we were passing for uh, banning single-use plastic and plastic bags. In that moment when he canceled the law, I got super mad. And I went into change.org and I created a change.org petition. And within hours, that petition got viral. And in two days, we had more than 20 organizations in front of the president and in front of legislators asking for the law to be passed. And it, it all started with one campaign in change.org. So you have to take into consideration that no, no step is a small step if you make it. And, and Daniela, you have a lot of knowledge about how to empower these um, young leaders to, to take that step, to do what Dewey just did with that law. How can you encourage these leaders that are thinking about what can I do to make that change? I have this idea, I want to do it, but how, where do I start? Yeah, so you know, I, I feel like a lot of people have asked me to just put this all on paper and I'm, one day I might write a book on this, <laughs> but I'll give you the preview of the steps and, and, and it's pretty, I would say simple, right? Like the first thing is you have to have self-awareness. You have to understand who you are as an individual. You have to understand what sacrifices you're willing to make. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Knowing who you are as a person is the number one thing you need to do as you're building your enterprise, as you're you know, leading political change, as you're leading grassroots movements, because if you don't know who you are, how can you inspire others to follow you? And, and that's a, I would say, an insight that I had myself. And being an entrepreneur, I've had to do so much self-work and you know, read all the books and teach yourself about what it is that you need to know. So that's number one. Number two is, is find an advisory board. Connect yourself with people that have the knowledge that you don't have. And it's OK not to know everything. Um, I think that being an entrepreneur, you feel as if you need to know how to do law and accounting and marketing and, mm -hmm. and finance. And the reality is that no one knows everything. And just having the humility and vulnerability to say, I don't know this and I need help is something that will take you a long way. So being able to surround yourself by, with people that have that expertise and being able to call upon them. Number three is being able to build a community. So once you have your idea, once you have you know, that, that seed being built, go out and find people that agree with you. Have conversations, shop your idea around, and you'll see that slowly you see yourself, you start building this wave of change because other people may think like you, but unless you speak up about it, they're not going to join you. And then of course you go into um, fundraising, right? So selling your idea, practicing you know, networking, practicing reaching out to uh, funders, investors, and having that be a part of the progress in building your idea. And then you get into you know, building a community of support and finding investors, finding you know, media supporters. Um, and I would say that's like the process for any uh -huh. entrepreneur that we've seen that has been successful in building you know, a nonprofit or for-profit ocean solution. It is possible. Do we do you have any uh, key advice for these young leaders that are listening to our conversation? My two advices for you would be to discover your nature and to never give up. And when I talk about discovering your nature, in Panama our motto for internal domestic tourism is uh, Panama by nature. And what we, when, when we talk about Panama by nature, we're not just talking about our environment, but also what you have inside, where you come from, as Daniela said, and where your ancestors came from, and what valuable knowledge they could, up, like they could give you, because uh, they have lived much more than us, and they have received knowledge from their ancestors as well. So we have to keep discovering where we come from in order to find solutions for the future. And never give up, because I know, I know, believe me, it's challenging. And eco-anxiety is something real. When I faced the reality in 2014, going back to Panama after one year world, and being the first climate activist in the country, and the first indigenous person to talk about this challenge in an international stage, I got very depressed, because I was alone 
or that I thought. And I felt that even though I wanted to do something, the children of my island will not have the same opportunities I had. I know that my islands are going to disappear. Even though Panama is a country, it's a carbon negative country. I know that our culture and our language is just as the, at the risk of disappearing in a couple of decades. But then I also realized that I wasn't alone. If you look around in the room, you're not the only one trying to find solutions for climate change. You're not the only one trying to make this world a better place. And when I realized that I wasn't alone, and as Daniela said, when I, I got to create this board and, and have people with different skills and knowledge in order to develop an idea that it's called Burigan. In my language, Burigan, Burigan means kids. And, and through art, we make awareness of climate change and, and we teach the kids how to make a change in their minds and then they talk to their parents and their parents are also taking the right steps to make the, the, the changes we need. After I got this organization and I had a team uh, that worked together with me, we were able to impact a lot of lives. And, and last year only, we were part of a TV show that reached more than a million people in Panama that now are aware about climate change and now know what they could do in order to solve this problem. What, what a remarkable job you're doing. Um, I'm sure you guys have questions, so we have like a, a couple of minutes for, for questions, if uh, Daniela and Dee, we are okay with it. I'm Kia from CSP, uh, but it's, it's going on in my mind and it's basically born out of sometimes also frustration uh, because I see so many cool local initiatives that really work in a local area uh, and that are so relevant, but sometimes it feels like can we should it be skilled? Like, should it be more regional? Should it be global? Like, to have more impact? Or, I'm just curious what your view is. Like, can we tackle problems? Like, all of the problems, maybe, by these local initiatives? Or, how can we scale it? How can we make it bigger? And how can we make it, or is it, is it not necessary? It's a broad question, so sorry for that. But, yeah. As part of our, our, our two programs, one of them is our, our for-profit startups. Um, the criteria we use is that the project has to be for-profit to have you know, a profitable business model. It has to be scalable to your point. It can't just be affecting one area. It has to um, be able to, to scale outside that, outside, that, outside that region. And number three has to be um, ocean positive. So we're not looking just to have like environmental impact that's not harming the environment. It has to have a positive impact on the ocean. So on the for-profit side, it's very, I would say it's easier to make it scalable, and I think it's a necessity. On the grassroots side, though, um, you do need to have those localized projects because they're so specific to the region that, that it's in that communities won't thrive if it's more of a, a model that is you know, being replicated all over the world. And so you need a, a little bit of both. So on the grassroots side, where we support youth leaders like Dewey, um, we do give grants that are very specific to that area or to the needs of that community because they, they are just so unique to the mangroves or to the you know, fish population. So I would say that's not an either or. It has to be an and, and they have to be able to work together hand in hand. Thank you. One more question. Yes. I am Shandel O'Neill from Trinidad and Tobago. I'm also a member of Sustainable Ocean Alliance Caribbean. My, aunt, my question is kind of really specific. Like part of being part of S Sustainable Ocean Alliance, we're not allowed to take money from oil and gas, and that's fair. But you have to understand, like Trinidad and Tobago's context, we are an oil and gas country. Like if you know the instrument, the steel pan, it is the only percussion instrument invented in the 20th century, and it's a big part of our culture, and it's built and designed from an oil drum. So that is us using waste to make something more cultural and everything. So my understanding is like, how do we unlock blue solutions? Because part of our culture and everything we are is working with the oil and gas. Like that is who we are. But part of being sustainable ocean alliance, we can't work with oil and gas. Like take money from them. So how do we find the balance? Like part of it is in my head is I think we have these companies also sponsor the cleanups so for the mistakes that they're making as well. But how do we balance it? Because this is our culture. This is what we have. This is the only wealth we have to to fund out anything we're trying to do. So where is the solution to that? That's my kind of Thank question. You. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, just, just to be clear, 
we, at my organization, the values that we align ourselves is we have to be looking at sustainable supporters, right? And we have to be looking at, at folks that are promoting the future of our planet, which is why we don't align ourselves with corporations that are actively harming the environment. And I agree, I think we need to be able to depend on capital that is coming from banks, right, that are not investing in fossil fuels, where we have to look for corporations and even startups that are now able to make enough revenue to give back, you know, to the community. So um, I would be happy to talk to you more in detail as to which corporations we can reach out to that are having a positive impact that can support because it has to change, right? Right now we have the fossil fuel industry has a grasp on the economy because they have so much power and because they have the influence. But what if we can change, you know, your country's economy to make it sustainable and to make it depend on sustainability? and regeneration as opposed, you know, as opposed to the damage that occurs. And it's going to take time. I think you know, we're all realistic. It's not going to happen overnight. But the more emphasis and support we can place as consumers and as investors and you know, as people that are you know, using our money towards you know, the good of the environment, that's how we're going to start moving in that direction. So definitely happy to talk to you offline about that. But I really appreciate the question. Thank you, Daniela. One last question. So I have to say thank you to Daniela because the company I work for is uh, SOA was one of our first supporters and investors, and also in my personal projects, um, actually starting indigenous-led um, seaweed cultivation in Colombia, I was also able to receive SOA support on that sort of grassroots side. So for a seaweed-based packaging company and then getting to the sourcing, it sort of represents the two sides of the SOA model. What I found really difficult is actually bridging really small-scale cultivation methods that are centering indigenous knowledge and scaling up very slowly with the very fast movement of the blue economy and this, these big questions of scale, meeting numbers as a company that now has venture investment, like how do you think that we can better bridge those sides and get the grassroots and the kind of corporate end into better conversation or maybe better supporting one another? The answer to that is investing in education on the ground, right? And being able to work with local populations and educate them and support them and give them the resources to understand exactly how to use a technology. Because right now there's a knowledge gap, right? Even when you look at sustainable fishing, a lot of fishermen don't want to change into sustainable practices because it's not normal to them. It's not you know, what they're used to. They don't understand the challenges or the technology that is used. And that gives us the opportunity to actually create a new market for populations to be educated, to be supported on the ground. And that's, I would say, an organization or innovation that I would challenge any of you to build and start. It's like, how can you start an education platform for local populations to be able to liaise right, with these startups that, um, that are coming into the area? Because you don't want to come in from the perspective of we have all the answers. You have to work with the local people to, to truly understand their needs and how you can partner um, in essence.